Good morning and welcome to church. Uh, welcome to uh, summer, if you would believe it. And welcome to the new normal where uh, there are a number of people who are not feeling well or have been told to self-isolate who cannot come to church today. But I think this is just how life works from now onwards. We are grateful that we can come today to turn our hearts to the Lord and to reflect on who He is. Now, I'm going to read a few verses from Psalm 103 to help us reflect on who God is. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all His benefits who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made, his known, he made, he made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. We approach our good God knowing that he is holy and righteous, but we can only approach him today because he's also kind and compassionate. He's merciful. He has sent the Lord Jesus Christ so that we could approach him in worship today, and we're going to make most of that opportunity by singing our first hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Thank you. Please be seated. Let's spend some time in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today because you alone are God. As the hymn writer has reminded us, you are holy, holy, holy. You are the king of creation. You are in charge of everything. Lord, you made us. We come to you not only because you are great and mighty, but also because you are good and right, and you are our salvation. We give you praise today for not leaving us alone to our own way of thinking. We praise you for sending your Son, Christ Jesus, to put us right with you and put all creation right with you. When we look at who you are, we are in awe of your greatness. We see your power, justice, majesty, and we see your unfailing love too. And so we praise you for who you are. When we look at ourselves though, Lord, we see sin. And so now as we turn to you, the righteous and mighty and holy God, we confess our sins. We confess that we have not loved as we should have. We have not loved our neighbor as we ought to. We are sorry. Please forgive us, our Heavenly Father. We thank you that you are faithful and you do forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. We ask, Lord, that you'd please be with us today by your spirit. You know the hearts of all your people who come to you today, from what life situation, from what burden, and from what joy they come to you. And so we ask you, our great and mighty God who formed us, especially individually, uh, from conception, who knows us so intimately, we ask that you would speak your word of life to our broken hearts so we would hope in you more. We ask that by your spirit you might be at work among all your people, turning us to you and turning us to Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Things, uh, Stephen was supposed to preach today, and no doubt it would have been a wonderful sermon. But uh, when he gets back, we can, we can hear his sermon. Good. Uh, we are going to read the Bible now. So you can read uh, from Ephesians 5, 
verses 21 to 33 with me. Uh, the reading will be on the screen, and uh, you can use your Bibles if you want to flip to it as well. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, his body of which he is savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to be present and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are all members of his body. For this reason will man for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This Bible passage uh, has many themes in there. One is about submission and relationships, about how husbands ought to love their wives as Christ loved the church and Christ gave himself for the church, and about how wives should respect their husbands. That's definitely a theme here, and it's a, it's a sermon for another day. But today we are going to look at Christ's relationship with the church, uh, and our title is The Bride of Christ. Before we look at this passage more closely, I'm going to pray, so let's pray. Lord, we come to you asking for a special measure of your Holy Spirit to be at work among us. Uh, as we just read, you are at work in your church, you love your church, you died for your church, and now we ask that uh, by your grace and by your mercy, you might be at work among us. Uh, you are always at work, even though we cannot see your good purposes. But today we ask uh, that by your spirit, you'd enliven our hearts so that we would turn to you and give you glory, praise, and honor. Please work in all our hearts, no matter which life situation we come from, so that we would hear your word of life for us today. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, I don't know what you do to wind down at the end of the day after you are very tired. Uh, for me, the way I wind down is I watch uh, car renovation shows and home renovation shows on television. It kind of switches my brain off. Uh, but the wonderful thing about that is that it, it's totally distracting. And so I do that at the end of the day, sometimes when I'm very tired, much to the amusement of my uh, family. The f a f in recent months, though, I've been watching uh, Selling Houses Australia, if you've seen that show. The, the story line is the same for every episode. You have a couple or a person who's trying to sell their home for a number of months, uh, they can't sell it, so they ask the Selling Houses Australia team to come in, and they swoop in, and they make a few high-impact changes and quick renovation, and very often the house sells soon after those changes. A few months back when I was watching an episode, they were selling a church that has been repurposed into a residential property, and they did their trick there, and the the church was sold as a beautiful home. So it got me wondering, how uh, often or how common is it for churches to be on sale and be converted to residential properties? It's a good question. So I did some research on domain, and it looks like it's a common thing. The domain article, a special article on this says, the churches across Australia are hitting the property market in a bid to be resurrected and transformed into stunning residential homes. 
it's interesting. It's quite a funny turn of phrase that they're hitting the property market to be resurrected and transformed into stunning residential homes. Um, but there are some churches that were referred to in the article, and there's some in the eastern suburbs here as well. Uh, there's one on Denison Street in Bondi Junction and another in Bellevue Street, Marubra. Now, being Protestant, we know that the church is comprised of the people, not the building. Christ's church is his people. And the research does tell us that worldwide, the church is growing. More people are coming into God's kingdom. But why are churches declining in our society? That's a, also a good question. Uh, in 2018, McCrindle contact, conducted some research in Australia, looking at faith and religion in Australia, and they asked a group of people these questions. One of the questions is, what do you value about the local church? And the largest group of people, people had lots of encouraging answers and all of that, but the largest group of people said this, I don't value anything about church. So society at large does not value church. But that shouldn't be all too surprising because if we have to be honest, and let's be honest here, uh, at times professing Christians also don't value the local church. I mean, how often do you find Christians uh, damaging the reputation of other Christians? How often do you find Christians saying demeaning things to Christ's body, other believers? If Christians don't value the church, well, the world is not going to do that as well. So is the local church valuable anyway? Is it that valuable anyway? That's a good question. If both professing Christians quite often and society doesn't quite value the local church. Well, let's look at this passage today to see what we can learn from here. Our title is The Bride of Christ. Now, this passage, like I mentioned, is speaking about both relationships at home and also about Christ's relationship with the church. And we're going to pick up that theme, Christ's relationship with the church. So how valuable is the, the, the church? The first thing we see here is that Christ died for his church. In verse 25, Paul asks husbands to love their wives, and he describes the Christ's love of the church to show what love really looks like. Uh, Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water and through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other ble blemish, but holy and blameless. We see here that Jesus loved the church. He loved this church so much that he died for the church, that she would be cleansed from all her sin. Notice the collective nature of Christ's love. It's not just for individual Christians. It's for the church, the body of people who belong to him. The people of God are important, so important to Christ that he died for them. Now, since the Reformation, we know that the church, we ought to know that the church is a group of believers. Uh, in case we forgot that, let's consider this for a moment. Uh, for example, a few years ago, uh, our family traveled to the Vatican City, and we went to visit St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, St. Peter's Basilica is the largest church in the world. It is a stunning building. When you go through the building, you'd be gobsmacked with Renaissance art and all sorts of beautiful sculptures and paintings. It's an absolutely wonderful, stunning building. But it also represents an artifact of why Presbyterians, Protestant people, broke away from the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, we know that building St. Peter's Basilica, it was quite an expensive undertaking. And so to actually finance that building, uh, Pope Leo X decided to sell indulgences, sell the forgiveness of sins, 
And that was the final straw that led to the Reformation. Uh, Roman Catholics still believe that churches are very important buildings, but millions f flock to St. Peter's Basilica daily, but they flock there not to hear the gospel of Christ's love for his people. This passage reminds us that Christ loves the group of people, the church. Obviously, buildings are important, but Christ died for, he didn't die for buildings, he died for his people. Now, Christian theologians throughout the ages have recognized the importance of Christ's relationship with his people, the church. Uh, for example, in the third century, um, the Christian Cyprian wrote that the church is mother for all believers. About the church, he wrote, from her whom we are born, by her milk we are nourished, by her spirit we are animated. John Calvin, the great reformer, wrote that for those for whom God is father, the church is mother, since this is a relationship which God himself established. The church is clearly very important to Christ because he died for her. Uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, our Presbyterian standard, says that outside the visible church, there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. A key word in our confession is ordinary. That means there are exceptions of, why, of people being saved outside the church. For example, the man on a desert island He'll be saved if Christ decided to save him without a church. The, the Muslim in an Islamic state where it's illegal to have uh, faith in Christ visibly and outwardly, yes, God can save them there. But the Bible teaches that God's pattern is that he saves people through the church. And people must love the church because he died for her. So since the church is so valuable to Christ, we must be cautious about how we treat other believers. Uh, for example, when Paul speaks about communion in 1 Corinthians uh, 3, uh, 11, he warns Christians against harming the body of Christ. Uh, Paul writes, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we are more discerning with regard to ourselves, we will not come under such judgment. Now this is worth considering. Uh, this is worth reflecting on. This is God's word. So the power of what Paul says is not dependent on how this message is delivered, in what context we deliver this message, and what the church looks like when we deliver the message. The power of this message is that it's accurate according to God's word, and this is a scary thing. Paul is saying when people don't regard the body of Christ, and we know the body of Christ is his body on the cross and how we deal with sin, but Christ's body is also how his believers, his other believers. And Paul is saying, when we don't regard the body of Christ, we get on the wrong side of Christ. He says, that's why some of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. What a scary thing. Paul is saying that if we don't regard God's body, we put ourselves on the wrong side of Christ. How scary is that? You know, I am in great fear when I see people complaining about church just to discourage other believers. I'm in great fear when I see people demeaning other believers. It is such a scary thing. The reason I'm scared is that when you do that, you are picking a fight with the Lord Jesus Christ himself because the church is so precious to Christ that he died for her. No, it's just not sensible. 
Why would you pick a fight with King Jesus? As the psalm reminds us, kiss the son, lest he be angry. Don't get on the wrong side of Christ. Our first point is Christ died for the church. Let's look at our second point now. Christ is the head of the church. Uh, verse 21 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, his body, of which he is savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so wives should also submit to their husbands in everything. So, like we said, the sermon is not about marriage, it's about submission and about the church submitting to Christ. And here it says, Christ is the head of the church, his body. He is the savior and the church submits to him. So how do Christ Christians submit to Christ and his body? Well, one obvious way is that believers, we read the Bible and we listen to it. We follow God's word as he reveals in scripture. Another way is that we respect the church, the decision-making structures, all the things that are around the church. It means that we submit to Christ. Now, submitting to Christ is a hard thing. In fact, uh, Jesus said this uh, to his disciples in Matthew. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. Following Jesus is difficult. In fact, it's impossible. We need God's spirit to work in our lives so that we, it makes sense to our hearts to deny ourselves, to submit to Christ, the head of our church. We can only submit through Christ's work of the spirit in our lives. And submission doesn't feel good. In fact, it feels horrible. Uh, at times. Uh, one Bible scholar writes this, submitting is a substantive and weighty act of self-denial. It can feel like death even though we know it's a path to life. Submission. It's such an odd thing in our day and age. Uh, according to philosophers, we are living in the age of authenticity where you have to like be yourself, be all you can be, be true to yourself. So submitting is a very difficult thing. God's spirit has to work in our lives so that we can submit to Christ. And that's an act, act of grace uh, on God's part to us when he allows us to submit to him. For example, uh, a few weeks back, I got a call from a believer who was fellowshipping at our church for the last few years. And uh, he's moving to another city because of family commitments. And he just paused to, to say, well, thank you for the Bible teaching. Please pass on his love to everyone at church for the fellowship. And uh, his testimony is actually very powerful. Uh, he said that he grew up in the age of, you know, the hippie kind of age where it was about being free and you were most respected when you lived your life on your own, ter own terms. A few years back, 2017, God intervened in his life, and now, miraculously, he submits to Christ day by day. God had saved him, saved him from his rebellious spirit so that he could submit to Christ. Now, for the world and people like him who've never attended church, Submitting is there's quite a contrast, isn't it? Uh, people out there in the world who don't call themselves Christian, they will live immoral lives on their own terms. And that's how their rebellion against Christ is seen. However, for those who uh, call themselves Christian and who refuse to submit to Christ, rebellion is, is less obvious uh, because professing Christians wouldn't go and do immoral things visibly, would they? In, instead, they'll rebel by subverting Christ rather than submitting to Christ. And how do people do this? Well, one way is gossip. A few weeks ago, I spoke to a believer, and uh, 
when I was speaking to that believer, they were very upset about things they had no first-hand knowledge about. So through the conversation, it became clear to me, well, this person is indulging in gossip. Her faith is weak, so difficult work through the conversation. Uh, I spoke to her, reminded her of God's great love to his people, of God's great goodness, and the gospel, basically. And eventually, at the end of that conversation, she was able to confess, well, God is good, and God is kind, and we ought to turn to him. Then a few weeks after that, I, I phoned her again, and she was back in the old state. Because in the interim, she was listening to gossip, subverting Christ. Gossip is one way we subvert to Christ. Now, there's been many ways to subvert Christ. Uh, but we ought to remember that the storyline of the Bible is that God is the great subverter. <laughs> remember when uh, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery? They thought they were, they were getting rid of Joseph. Then when Joseph met his brothers again in Genesis 50, he tells him this, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You see, God is the great subverter. He cannot subvert Christ. We really can't. Uh, the religious people of the day, they lied, they schemed, they plotted, and they killed Christ. God subverted that to save his people. We cannot subvert the Lord God Almighty. He is king. Jesus always wins. That's a storyline of the Bible. Jesus always wins. And the good news for believers is the church submits to Christ because Christ is our head. Christ, our head, always wins. So we're looking at the value of the church and the, seeing that the church is the bride of Christ. We've seen that Christ died for the church and Christ is head of the church. Now let's look at our third point. Christ loves his church intimately. So during the Bible reading, uh, as I read it, you may have been wondering why are we speaking about the church when this passage seems to be about marriage. But look at verse 31 there. Verse 31 says this, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now Paul's quoting from Genesis there, and he says, This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. This marriage quote is referring to Christ and the church, and up to this point we may have been thinking, well, God is using a marriage metaphor to kind of illustrate what Christ's love for the church is, but here we see it's the other way around. God, the whole institution of marriage is a foreshadow of Christ's love for his church. Marriage is only a dim reflection of Christ's love for the church. Christ's Desire, Christ desires his bride, the church, and he desires the church to be pure. Look at verse 25 again. A husband love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. We are the bride of Christ. So that means we ought to live holy lives that honor Christ Jesus. Right now, believe it or not, God is working in his church, cleansing it to make it pure so that one day the church will be presented to him without stain or wrinkle or blemish. So, how do you know, then, just reflective for a few moments, how do you know that God is at work in your life? It's a good question. Is it about how you feel when uh, you read the Bible, a strong feeling? That, that may be true. Is it how you feel when familiar songs and hymns are played and you walk in and you have a certain aura? Does that mean God is at work in your life? Well, God is very gracious. He works in, in many ways. How do you know if God is at work? Is it in, in the things that work out well in your life? 
relationships going well, having material blessings. Well, all good gifts come from the Lord, uh, but the Bible tells us the way we know that God's Spirit is at work in our lives is when He conforms our life to submit to Christ more and more and more. Think about it. God sent His Son to do the impossible thing, to give us new hearts and new lives. Surely God's priority is to work in the lives of his people, to purify them, so that we will be the spotless pride of Christ. God is at work in your life when you submit to Christ, when we turn to him, because we will be presented to him as his spotless pride. And God works in all kinds of ways that we don't imagine, and also in ways that we, in all honesty, would, would prefer not to go through. God works in his own way to purify his people. Uh, this week, the Presbyterian minister, Tim Keller, tweeted, this was just a few days ago, he says this, I have stage four pancreatic cancer, but it's endlessly comforting to know and have a God who is both infinitely more wise and more loving than I am. He has plenty of good reasons for everything, he does, and he allows things that I cannot know, and therein is my hope and strength. Keller knows that he's going to die very soon, but we see God at work in his life by conforming him to the image of Christ, in helping him to submit to his will even when he doesn't understand it. Christ works in each believer, and so he works in his church. So we opened our talk today by considering how valuable is the church, and that's a good question. How valuable is the church? Uh, we get letters in our post box very often by real estate agents offering tens of millions for ch the church property. That's quite impressive. Uh, the buildings here in Rosebay, church buildings have been converted to gyms, to creches, to all sorts of things. Uh, so how valuable is the church? Well, if we don't love his church, if we don't submit to Christ, our only value of a church will be the value that the highest bidder pays for us. Today we see that the church is very special to Christ. Christ loved the church and he died for her so that we would be his spotless bride. Let's pray. Lord, we give you praise for your goodness and your love. We give you praise for your word. Uh, now, when, when we think about reading your word, we, 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 we come to it with humility. We come to your, to your word with a sense of wanting to hear what you say. And so very often, Father, we confess that you say things that are uncomfortable to us. And therein is our hope because we do not manufacture what you say to us. Uh, you tell us what your, what your will is through your scriptures. And we thank you so much for this passage today. We thank you that uh, you speak your words of life to us. We thank you that your patience means salvation. The longer the Lord Jesus takes in coming means that the longer we have to submit to Christ, to turn to him, and to enjoy the blessing of living in obedience to him here on earth. We thank you for your love to your people through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for doing what we could not do on our own, by our own strength. Uh, you sent Christ Jesus to us. And as we come up to Christmas, we remember that God, the incarnate Son of God, became permanently became human to take up our flesh so that we would be purified and be presented holy to him one day. Lord, we know that we cannot work our way up to you. We know that no amount of obedience will put us right in your sight. It's only through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we ask that you join us truly to Christ so we would know both the justification that comes in a right standing with you, but also know the work of your spirit in our lives that, that make us more and more obedient to you. Please have your way with us. Please have your way with your people. Please have your way with your church because you are good and you are kind and you are mighty.
And we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. I leave you with the words from Revelation, which says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Amen. Thank you.